After an intense couple of opening episodes, it's back to Talkie Talkie Land, as Maddie, Alicia, and Nick try to find their place at the ranch. Not to worry, at least they got a huge stack of Jeremiah Otto's Paranoia Prepper vids to check out. It's Fear the Walking Dead, Season 3, Episode 3, Tale Tuaki, End of the World Stuff, man. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of Fear the Walking Dead. So yes, spoilers, lots of them are shambling slowly towards us. Alright, so like I had mentioned, we are kind of back into the talking land. Less action, well, almost no action in this episode. And it's really set up. We are looking at the world that the Clark family has found themselves in. And while, yes, I was joking about the paranoia prepper vids for Jeremiah Otto, obviously there was some truth to his preparation or a reality that paid off for that since we are in the Walker apocalypse and, you know, he's still alive and got his ranch and supplies and everything. So, good on him. Uh, but what we are looking at is the environment that that creates. And we're looking at really the specific, the, the kind of stereotypical prepper that we have, the ultra-patriotic, Christian conservative, waiting for the fall of civilization, which is about to come any time, sort of an end-time scenario, and so that they can be there to survive uh, as, as the world gets rebuilt. So, in some ways, that did pay off. The world did end, not exactly as everyone was, uh, was expecting, as Jeremiah had mentioned last week. But we still have the same type of group, which the group ha which, which now the Clark family has to find their way around with them. And while we are still looking at a, a Christian-based group, they're not really very welcoming uh, to the newcomers. Um, and that's something that sort of Maddie starts to establish herself very quickly on. She drifts right into the old southern accent right there and just praising Jesus and we want to thank you all for opening up your hearts in order to get... So Maddie has, she's using that southernness to her. She is definitely willing to, to, to work the edges in order to get into this group and find herself of safety. The kids, not quite so much. Uh, but this is all of them kind of finding their place. Uh, with Maddie, it's sort of linking up with Jeremiah in some sense. They're finding a similarity between the two of them, the way that, that they have been raised, their own history. Um, and while Maddie is certainly willing to sort of uh, uh, change herself in order to fit in with the group, she is always very direct and straightforward with Jake, with Troy especially, and with Jeremiah. A lot of confrontations that were going on, especially between her and Troy, and while Troy is kind of, again, still that creepy guy, we do get to see another kind of side with him with this episode. Uh, the flashbacks that we got um, from the, the, <laughs> the filming of the prepper video, which is oddly set and placed in the midst of the video library. It, it sort of seemed out of place. Uh, but what we get to see from behind those scenes are the conflict between Otto and his wife, his second wife, Troy's mother. Um, not a good relationship. She's obviously been a drinker, which connects in with Maddie because her husband was a drinker also. Uh, but Troy exposed to a lot of this conflict at the young age. We really get to see how he is emotionally reacting to the conflicts between Otto and his mother and how Jake sort of has to step in to take care of him. Uh, as Jeremiah later on says, as uh, Troy's mom sort of drifted in and, and, and sort of went in towards the edge, it was Troy's job to take care of her, or maybe it was just his own wanting to do that, wanting to be there to take care of as his mother descended. And of course, she didn't really show the appreciation to him. So a lot of complications growing up in Troy's uh, uh, youth, which sort of just snowballed into the semi-psychotic individual that he is today. Uh, however, also with both eyes, it's nice to see that Troy's eye was healing up uh, uh, quite nicely. I thought that that was out, but I guess the digging went underneath down here, not into the eye to, to pop out. So, so that's good with him. So really, a lot of interesting stuff so with, with uh, Maddie sort of finding her place, her transformation while confrontational with Jeremiah. Then by the end, 
starting to starting to connect, trying to find some similarities, which may play out for her very well as by the end of the episode, Jeremiah shows her the giant pantry downstairs, just chock full of food, supplies, and lots and lots of guns. Alicia, in the meantime, a little bit more confrontation, not quite so much as Nick. Uh, Nick is definitely a lot more of a confrontation, but, he, but he's going through sort of a different thing right now. For Alicia, she's still sort of reeling from the events that just transpired. I mean, again, it, 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 it's, it hasn't been long since they left. It's only been like, what, two days since they left the hotel, since she stabbed the guy in order to save Travis. And then immediately afterwards, Travis saving them ends up dying. So in some ways, Alicia is kind of caught in this middle position of what, what is the point of anything? What, what it, why is it that we are here? She stepped a line, she killed, and it was rather easy for her, uh, as she tells the group. But now she is sort of reacting to being in the new place, the loss of Travis, and, and questioning a lot of why, what is it that we're here for? Um, which is good that she ends up hooking up with the Bible study group. I love that whole transition. <laughs> She's really afraid of how uh, the really offering is like, oh yeah, come on down, it's Bible study time and we'll check things out. And, and you can see the, just the dread in her, however, willingness to try and, and move through it, to try and, and, and grasp, to try and, and, and hold on to this group that they are now uh, a part of. Works out well for her. Kind of glad that Nick didn't go in that sense. Nick being the addict, probably being exposed to drinking and smoking may not be the best environment for him. I think right now, being free of all that, a little easier for him to focus on, on, on what's going on with him. Uh, but with Alicia, I think that was a nice way to sort of connect with a bunch of kids, sort of open things up, and also start to lay some groundwork for some new potential allies. As she tells them, you cannot just depend on the other people on Troy and those soldiers to go out and to take care of you and to protect you, not in this new world. So for Alicia, while a sort of comical little, little journey for her, uh, she's definitely starting to find a group and uh, certainly enjoying the uh, praising of turning water into wine. Now, of course, Nick, like I said, is dealing with a lot of emotions, a lot of reactions for himself. Like we talked about last week, he is blaming himself for Travis's death, for everyone being in the situation that he is. He took a leadership position. He tried to lead the Col uh, uh, La Colonia into safety, and pretty much everybody gets killed. Uh, Luciana gets shot. Travis ends up dying while saving all of them, and the family is with. So he's feeling a lot of it. I didn't like Maddie throwing that in his face. I thought that was rather cruel of her uh, and kind of unnecessary at this point. He's obviously, you know, sort of torturing himself and very reactive. He is protective of Luciana. He is paranoid of this new group that they are in because he doesn't trust anyone. He trusts his family. He knows keeping them around. Having Troy in the immediate area certainly doesn't help. And then Luciana also reacting the same way. She doesn't want to stay anymore. So Nick's really getting pulled in a couple of different directions right now. As much in some ways how he wants to find a point of safety, his real goal is to try and keep the whole rest of the family together. Now, <laughs> the whole final sequence with Troy I found really, really interesting. Um, first of all, <laughs> Obviously, when Troy is offering to take you out in the middle of the night to go hunting, you should be concerned. That should not be a good feeling for you. Uh, if Troy hands you a gun to make you feel good, really would have thought Nick would have at least checked to make sure that it was loaded. Yes, weight-wise, you can tell these things, but visually, this is something that would have clued us in as the audience to, to watch out. Um, but their whole little last scene, as Nick kind of confronts him, I don't think at any point here Nick was really trying to kill Troy, I think he was trying to make a statement of to watch out, to look out, I'm keeping an eye on you. That, that whole kind of back and forth, those whole sort of men just throwing out and stuff like that. But it didn't fall the same way. While Troy is kind of messed up, he does seem to be intrigued by the walkers, by the way they turn, by what happens. And that is not too different from Nick. 
who's also kind of obsessed with the whole dead and the way that he walks and dresses. I mean, we got the poster like here, but that was Nick Hap most of last season, covered in blood and wandering through with the walkers. So this really starts to put kind of an odd connection between the two of them. And so when Nick shoots, again, not to kill, but just a statement of, I could have, and then steals the notebook, it sort of giddily just starts peeling the pages away and running around. I mean, he was like suddenly five years old messing with a brother. We got a lot of that sort of brother feel. We got it earlier between Jake's protectiveness of Troy, and now we get sort of the more playful edge. And while, you know, and I think what that did is, is that that does lead to a certain link. I think Troy has a certain acceptance of Nick that he's willing to step out to push out, but there's also a playfulness. There's, he doesn't know everything about Nick. I think as he finds out more, he might end up being more and more intrigued with him. Um, but in some ways, I think this sets up a really interesting pairing between the two of them. In some ways, enemies can become the closest of friends. We'll just have to wait to see if that's what happens here. And then finally, of course, we have Strand, who is kind of a side story in this episode. And honestly, I'm not I'm not feeling a whole lot of connection. I like Strand. I liked him in the seasons, but right now, very floaty with where he is going. Um, and he doesn't really seem to be as smart as he is for being such a smart man. Driving past a whole line of people waiting to get supplies in your big fancy car with your chewed up little snack wrappers in the seat, that's how you get mugged. That's how you get jumped. How someone jumps in your convertible, beats your ass, throws you out of the car, and, and takes it. So I was kind of surprised about that. But what they're trying to do with that scene is establish how he is self-interested. He comes to the front of the line. He offers the car. He just wants to talk with Dante. He doesn't want to deal with anything else. He doesn't want to take his time. He is seeing himself as more important, that he can think and move things through. Even when he talks with Dante as they're having their whole kind of happy conversation, you know, with memories of Thomas, Dante asks him straight out, what do you have? You are just here surviving on your wits and your charisma. So Strand is not offering anything in, in any substance. And in this world, that is kind of a necessity. Certainly Dante has this whole lot different view of the world uh, and hating the takers. In some ways, you just kind of appreciate that. But there seems to be a stronger thing between him uh, and Strand. I'm hoping that we'll find out a little bit more because Dante's reactions, even for someone like that, seems way over the top from a business relationship. Yes, he had told Strand that he was just a taker uh, and he just took these things and land and so on. Uh, but there seems to be something a lot stronger with that. Do have to say... The dropping people down into the pile of walkers, that is nasty. It's one thing to be thrown off a building, bridge, a dam. Not entirely sure what that structure was. Water processing plant, probably with all the water. Uh, but God, one of those things when you're tossed off the top of a building and the fall doesn't kill you because you land in a pile of walkers and they kill you. That was nasty. I mean... Cool, in an undead kind of way, but nasty. All right, just a couple of things. Uh, one, the, <laughs> the emergency bucket you get with your video order. I love how it has everything, a compass and a pocket constitution. Again, we are appealing to the ultra-patriotic, you know, conservatives here. So that makes sense, though it's funny in the idea of, like, if you're waiting for the fall of the United States because its time has come, it has overloaded itself, why would you want a copy of the Constitution? Like, you're going to rebuild this great nation that you thought just failed and fell apart? I don't know. Also, it deals really more interstate commerce and larger government. It has nothing to do with local stuff, so it's just kind of a funny thing to me <laughs> to be left in there. Also thinking in rebuilding the world afterwards, they'd probably make a few changes to that their constitution. Thank you for asking about the chopper straight off. Yes, it's the background story that goes on. At the end, we finally get some information, or in a way, lack of information. Uh, but at the very least, that was one of the first questions that was asked at the whole funeral service. And I have to say thank you for it, because I hate it when they don't deal with these important situations. Yes, it wasn't dealt with, but at least it was addressed. And that's good.
I love using Jeff as a conversational icebreaker. You know, Jeff has some questions, would like to know this. You know, well, Jeff wants to know this. Well, I want to ask Jeff these questions. Kind of an appropriate, perfect, post-apocalyptic party favor gift right there. I don't know. I just, I love the head in the cage and just sort of using him as a conversation tool was just that eh, clever. The fact that Troy knows it's going to take exactly 87 minutes for him to turn. Uh, very interesting character moment. Like I said, however creepy and weird that he is, that he does have a study of this, that he does have an understanding, uh, I think. Just really interesting character stuff starting to come out of Troy. And then finally, of course, the episode ends with the reappearance of Old Man Salazar. Reuben Blades is back. Um, and what is he doing there? That was so odd. I mean, you're thinking, is he an illusion or not? Now, at the end of season one, we did hear that Reuben Blades would be returning for season three. I don't know if he had a job or something else that he had to do, um, but we did get the... So him returning is not necessarily that much of a surprise. Uh, but what is he doing there, and why does he hate Strand so much? I thought the two of them had kind of bonded in a certain way, though perhaps the whole thing that happened to Thomas's... Um, uh, Casa down there in Mexico might have changed some things. Obviously he is still alive, it's not an illusion. We never saw him die, we just saw the fire go off. So next week I'm sure we're going to hear the story of about how he survived and how he got up to go after Strand, but I don't know yet. I think they're really stretching the coincidence bug right here. We'll have to sort of wait and see how they paint that picture. All right, so I think that's going to wrap things up for us for this week. So, as usual, if you did enjoy this, go ahead and hit that like button. Thoughts, ideas, comments, throw them down in the section below. I love our chats. Please keep them up. Really enjoy all of your comments in the back and forth. We get to have sort of building on what we've talked about in the show here today. So, please keep that up. You can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Darren Jakes. Now, don't forget, if you are not a subscriber, very easy to do so. You can do that by hitting my face right here, and I will throw up our latest review for American Gods right up here. You can check that out. So, I am D, and I'm out of here. I'll catch you guys next week. Bye-bye.